You see, I'm going to close the app. I thought you might. It's on this menu. Yeah. It's there. It's there. Thank you, Mitch. Any other comments? Massive stars. Oh, yeah. massive, massive stars. I think they're. I think they're losing the color sense. I think they're primarily young. They're so massive that they must have wins. They have wins. Well, I guess this is probably. Well, I think we're about to find out. <laughs> as well. Everyone, you're pretty decently quick now. Um, Peter is visiting us, Peter Shikluna is visiting us from uh, Asia A. He's not visiting us actually, he's visiting next door, I guess. Um, but uh, he's visiting us from next door right now. <laughs> um, so uh, was, uh, he, Peter told me that he meant to put in a bunch more optical and infrared stuff, but I told him not to worry, we'll be interested in anything no matter the way it <laughs> okay, uh, thanks for letting me come and talk. Um, yeah, uh, there was supposed to be a lot more material in this at shorter wavelengths, um, but I just ran out of time basically to modify my slides from my previous talk and put in new material and whatever. So it's pretty much the same as the, my usual talk for this sort of format, which is almost all far infrared and sub stuff. So I totally understand if you fall asleep as a result of that. It's okay. <laughs> Just try not to snore too loudly. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about some work on uh, evolved stars and their mass loss, um, some sort of bit of literature review, and then some ongoing work. I have to credit. Hopefully, it doesn't show up on the screen. Uh, oh yeah, it's a stick. <laughs> okay. Cool. cool. <laughs> I have to credit all these people. Um, and that's a very small fraction of the people who deserve some credit for the things I'm going to show. Um, but they're the ones whose names fitted on there. So I hope you'll uh, bear in mind that this is work produced by a big team of people, and they all deserve some uh, acknowledgment for what they've done. So OK, Evolve Stars, why should you care? basically is the starting point. It's not exactly a fashionable field at the moment, so I always feel like I have to try and convince people that it's worth actually studying them. Um, the biggest reason I would say that your average astronomer would care about evolved stars is the life cycle of matter. So you form stars, they process material throughout their lifetime, they dump it back into the ISM at the end of their lifetime, and that material is what goes on to form the next generation of stars and so on and so forth. So if you want to understand how you're fueling star formation, uh, you do need to understand what evolved stars are doing, what they're putting back into the ISM. Uh, if you want to understand chemical enrichment of galaxies, then evolved stars are the way that you get those, uh, those elements back into the ISM, uh, or you know, supernovae as well. Um, but we'll just pretend they don't exist for a little while. So AGB stars, which is what most of the talk is going to focus on in terms of uh, evolved stars instead of their more massive counterparts. Um, AGB stars are a very complex system with lots of nonlinear processes interacting, and it makes them either a theorist's dream or a theorist's nightmare, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, so you have deep in the, in the star, you have uh, ongoing nuclear fusion. Uh, converting hydrogen into helium and helium into carbon and all sorts of other processes like the S process going on. Um, and then the star is, the entire star is convective. So you're taking material from the regions where nuclear synthesis is happening and dredging it right the way up to the surface because the convection cells are you know, almost the entire radius of the star. Um, the star is pulsating. So the radius is changing, uh, and those pulsations <laughs> launch material up to uh, a few stellar radii uh, where the material gets cool enough that dust can start to condense. Um, and then, because you've got dust, you've got a nice surface for chemical reactions to take place on, uh, catalyzing formation of various molecules, 
and you've got photochemistry going on. So all of those processes I just mentioned, you could think of as a, a nonlinear process in and of itself. So working with that by itself is already difficult. And when you put all of these things together, uh, things get really complicated. I haven't even mentioned binaries or magnetic fields yet, uh, but don't worry, I'll try to avoid those for most of this talk. Uh, but that would make the picture even more complicated. So let's stick with this assumption that uh, as an average astronomer, what you care about is how much material evolved stars uh, dump into the ISM and what that material is like. So what that means matters most is mass loss. Uh, and if you want to understand that, if you want to model it, we need to understand the physics of mass loss. And that's what the evolved stars community is trying to sell you. How do we, uh, how do we understand that? Um, and as I said, there's a lot of different processes that are intertwined in this. And it looks like the most important ones now are, in fact, pulsation, um, because that is the process that is actually launching the material uh, in order to initiate the wind. Um, and you can see quite clearly here we have a, a proxy for the mass loss rate versus the, the period. And you can see that there are quite clearly three zones. You have a zone where the period is short and there is no mass loss. You have a zone where the period is very long and there is a lot of mass loss. And in between you have this sort of transition region uh, where you sort of kick off, maybe there's you know, one type of mass loss occurring and then you switch to a different mode of mass loss at longer periods. Are you saying there's a transition because there's like a little valley there on the dashed line? Um, right, so this dashed line is the color you would expect for zero mass loss. Oh. So that's the, basically the line here of zero mass loss or thereabouts. Why are there things, oh, what are the things below it? Are those just not stars? Uh, no, there are, all of these are stars. Um, I'll have to ask Ian exactly how I'm supposed to interpret that to make sure. Um, but yeah, you can basically say that these things should have zero mass loss and all of these have some mass loss. Um, there's clearly some parameters here that we don't understand because this is a very fat region with you know, this point, for example, should be up here somewhere if you believe the trends that are on that and that sort of thing. Um, and if you break it down further into actually measuring the mass loss rate itself instead of proxy, and comparing that against sort of luminosity, outflow velocity, uh, and pulsation period, then first up, you can see immediately that there's not really a very strong dependence of either of the, the, out, the, the mass loss rate or the velocity um, on luminosity. But again, when you look at pulsation period, you can see sort of the same sort of trend of no mass loss, some mass loss, lots of mass loss. Um, but this is also reflected in the velocity of the outflow. So you're going from sort of these are simple chromospheric winds, which you know, there's some, obviously there's some mass loss in this zero mass loss region, um, but they have very different properties to here when you go into this sort of intermediate region. And then here the outflow velocity starts to really ramp up. Uh, so we think this is a transition from chromospheric to pulsationally driven, which we really don't understand at all, and then a dust driven wind, which we understand pretty well. You have continuum radiation pressure on the dust grains, and that drives the, like, accelerates the dust grains up to a terminal velocity and drags the gas along with it. So in that case, in that region, what we also care about is the properties of the dust. Uh, so if your wind is dust driven, then how, how you can drive the wind depends on how much radiation pressure you can generate on an individual dust grain. Um, and things were going you know, very smoothly about uh, 20 years ago or so with uh, models for carbon stars very easily producing winds because carbon, carbon grains are very stable. They form close to the star. Uh, you can heat them up quite a lot and they don't, uh, don't sublimate. Um, so everyone thought this is great. And then they turned their attention to oxygen rich dust. Now silicates, which make up the bulk of oxygen rich dust are a lot less stable. Uh, and so you immediately can see there's gonna be a problem there. Um, it becomes particularly problematic when you start integrating iron into the dust grains. Iron is a great absorber, but again, not very stable. So if you 
assume that your dust formation should happen at the same radius as it does for carbon stars and start putting an iron into your grains, all the dust just disappears. You can't form any dust. The gr grains are so hot there that there's no way for them to condense. If you pull the iron out, however, they condense really nicely at the same radius. The problem is that then the grains are basically completely transparent. So they don't have any, uh, any absorption capacity. So it raises the question of how can you actually drive a wind when your grains don't absorb anything? Well, if the grains are in a very narrow region of grain size parameter space, they become very, very efficient scatterers. Uh, and if they're in that region, then they can actually produce enough radiation pressure just from scattering photons with no absorption. Uh, and they stay cool because they're transparent and not absorbing anything, obviously. Um, and so then you, you drive this uh, so-called scattering driven or Hofner wind, as we've come to refer to it. Um, and when Susanna predicted this, there was then a flurry of activity to go and look at some stars uh, which would be suitable to try and find these grains. And uh, we've now successfully found them in some AGB stars and uh, in red supergiants as well. Um, and with instruments like Sphere and GPI, we're now really uh, getting a lot of these uh, multi-wavelength polarimetry measurements that you need to do this and pinning down grain sizes uh, in quite a big sample of, uh, of sources. Um, now, of course, dust composition, as I was mentioning, also has a big impact. Um, and this is much more challenging to measure than grain size because well, you really need a space telescope. Uh, you need a wide band infrared spectrograph like ISO or Spitzer or something like that to uh, observe the features that you're interested in. And so there's really only a handful of systematic studies about this, the best of which was by Olivia Jones about five years ago, looking at LMC and, SF and uh, galactic sources and trying to see if there's any sort of trend in the, uh, the abundance. And you can see there's something here, um, although the statistics aren't great and uh, the, well, it probably needs to be uh, reprocessed now that we've got better ideas of how things work and what's going on. But there is probably some trend here with the uh, metallicity in terms of the uh, abundance. So you have more silicate at higher metallicity, um, which means that you've got probably more opacity at higher metallicity. And therefore, you can uh, change the way that your wind is being driven. Um, but I'm not going to spend too much time on that. OK. So the thing that you're really interested in, if you actually care about you know, fueling star formation and galactic enrichment and that sort of thing, is measuring the amount of material that is being injected back into the ice. So there are some very easy ways of doing this. Um, the easy way is to take something like Spitzer and point it at a random galaxy and image the entire galaxy in the infrared. And you'll find that you know, all of the dusty things just pop out in the mid-infrared because they're bright. Uh, and you can go and classify them, separate the uh, AGBs and red supergiants from other sources, uh, compute dust production rates for everything, either with some sort of empirical relationship between the colors or using uh, radiative transfer models, and you add them all up. And so this is what the SAGE uh, team did for the LMC and SMC. And when you do this, you find that this relatively small population of sources marked here in this sort of gold color uh, dominate the dust production in the LMC. Um, I think it's something of the order of 5% of evolved stars producing 80% of all the dust. Uh, so if you then assume that you can just you know, extrapolate that uh, with a dust to gas ratio to get a, a gas production rate, then all of the material that you're dumping back, in, back into the ISM is produced by a very small fraction of stars. Um, and they are probably those few sources right at the end of their uh, AGB lifetime, just ejecting their entire envelope. So Spitzer was very, very efficient at doing this. Um, these are all measurements of local group galaxies, uh, dwarf galaxies, some globular clusters, taken by Spitzer between a few different uh, survey projects. Um, and you can see there's quite a nice sort of trend here that basically the bigger something is, the more dust it's producing, which is not exactly surprising. Um, but you'll notice 
at least one very, very conspicuously missing point that if you believe the trend should be about here somewhere, which is our own galaxy. Uh, there are reasons for that. Obviously, observing these sources in the galaxy with, say, Spitzer is very hard because they're incredibly bright. Uh, you would, for most of them, saturate the, the uh, IRAC detectors in too short a time for it to even be possible to observe. Um, but there's also other effects like extinction and so forth that make this difficult. But what we really need if we want to you know, understand what's going on in bigger, uh, higher metallicity galaxies is to put our own galaxy on there, or M31, uh, M31, yes, right one, um, so that we can see you know, how does this evolve with metallicity, what does, what does a more normal galaxy do? Um, and to do that, we need a volume-limited sur survey of nearby evolved stars within, uh, within our own solar neighborhood. Is extinction well, uh, important for the, the other galaxies, you know, inclination effects and things like that? I'm not too sure. I don't think so for most of these, because basically what you do is you just find the few brightest, uh, brightest mid-infrared sources and say, okay, these are the extreme AGB stars. And if they measure 80% of the dust, then, you know, we've now basically got what we need to know. Uh, so those things are so bright at 8 micron that extinction is irrelevant, basically. Okay, now dust, as I said, you're reliant on a, a dust to gas ratio if you want to understand how much material in total is being put into the ISM. So if you really care about, say, how much hydrogen you're putting back into the ISM, you need to go and look at tracing the, the bulk gas uh, or the bulk material, i.e. the gas. And so this is also sort of relatively straightforward if you uh, think about it as an individual source. Um, you take a submillimeter telescope and you observe the CO lines. Uh, you do some radiative transfer to fit the profiles of those lines. You get out some parameters that you care about, particularly mass loss rate. Um, but of course, all you've gone and done now is measured a CO mass loss rate, not an H2 mass loss rate, which is what you care about. Uh, there are some other caveats here. We always observe the low J CO lines because those trace the whole envelope. Um, but that's tracing the coldest gas, which is really not comparable with the hot dust that you're sensitive to in the mid infrared, the Spitzer. And because of sensitivity, this is really only feasible for galactic sources. Uh, ALMA can observe a few of the very brightest Magellanic cloud sources, but unless we can amp you know, build another ALMA with a few thousand dishes, we're not getting anywhere in uh, extragalactic studies of CO lines. Um, so these two plots are pretty much the state of the art in that regard right now. Um, this is one of the bigger surveys of single dish CO uh, mass loss rates. And you can pretty much tell just from looking at those that there really are not enough sources in these, uh, these surveys to see whether there's any trends that we should be pulling out. There's just not enough data to work with there. And you might just think, okay, you know, if you look at a population and you see how the mass loss rate evolves over the population, that gives you some information that you can put into your models and uh, figure out what's going on. But it turns out that that's not enough because the mass loss rates are variable on much shorter time scales than those population studies are going to tell you about. Um, so, if you, so you do actually need to study the mass loss history. And this is, again, pretty easy to do with CO lines. You take a whole bunch of different lines, and if you think about it, each independent pair of lines is sensitive to one different uh, episode of mass loss, if you want to think about it like that. So you can go and take a whole load of lines and end up fitting all these different episodes here that have to all sort of match up smoothly. Um, so this scale is long, right? So you've got a total range of three orders of magnitude in mass loss rate uh, on a time scale of a few thousand years. Uh, that is pretty common from what we've seen, huge variations in mass loss rate on thousand or 10,000 year time scales. Uh, so you do need to take this into account because it's affecting the total amount of mass that you assume each star is losing and therefore the time scale over which it loses it. And you can see some very extreme examples of this. Uh, these are quite low resolution single dish CO observations 
uh, and so two different sources. And you can see that there's you know, a ring of CO with a gap, and then in this case, another source in the middle of it. Now these are, like I said, these are extreme. These are where we're actually seeing the remnant of the thermal pulse from when helium fusion was initiated, and you just blast off the whole layer of the envelope. Uh, and so yeah, you get this nice clean ring. Um, okay. Um, and you can also think about the extreme version of that multi-line method where you just go and take a Herschel spectrum, you have hundreds or thousands of lines in one of those spectra. Um, all of these are sensitive to mass loss in the envelope and you can really probe, say, the shape of the acceleration zone uh, if you're interested in things like that. Uh, but I will move on quickly. Um, you can also, of course, do this in dust. Uh, Herschel, another place where Herschel was great, uh, Pax was spectacularly sensitive and could actually resolve the envelopes of nearby uh, AGB stars in the far infrared, giving us these beautiful pictures. These are probably not the best examples of uh, the images it produced, but they show you that you, know, you can see out to an arc minute or so, uh, quite a lot of extended emission, and this is pretty normal for data from Pax. But of course, Herschel died. Uh, it ran out of coolant, uh, as all missions were, were bound to do, and, back then, eventually. Um, so that kind of leaves us stuck. Sophia is great, but uh, it's not really sensitive enough to do this sort of thing. So how can you get around that? Well, the JCMT is probably the next best thing. Uh, Scuba 2 is the state of the art in terms of submillimeter mapping on uh, large scales. Uh, it's about a factor of 100 faster than any of its competitors. And what you can, what you can do if you uh, go and observe some of those Herschel sources. Uh, so this is work done by a really good uh, graduate student in Taipei. Um, you can you know, map the envelope at uh, even longer wavelengths than, uh, than Herschel did. So you've gone to longer wavelengths, so you're sensitive to even colder dust. Um, you can put all of that data together and start trying to fit uh, the evolution of the envelope as you go out to a larger radii. Um, and what we found from doing this is Basically that in every source, uh, the mass loss rate has varied within the last 10,000 years or so. And if you were to put this together with resolved gas observations, like the ones I showed you a minute ago, you can actually trace the evolution of the dust to gas ratio uh, over time. And this one's kind of pushing it for scuba two because we need, a, need to be a bit deeper than the, it really allows us. But in principle, you can start looking for deviations from symmetry in the same data set. Um, so, having convinced ourselves that it, uh, it is possible to do this with the JCMT, we thought, what the hell, we'll just go and uh, ask for an enormous amount of observing time and see if they're crazy enough to give it to us. So, we uh, went and put together a survey of uh, 45 of the nearest dusty AGB stars and 400 stars within uh, two kiloparsecs with slightly different observing strategies for each of them. Uh, this is currently the largest volume-limited survey of galactic AGB stars. Um, so here you can see our sample and how we split it up. Uh, we're trying to get sort of roughly even sampling across uh, five, six, whatever it is, six orders of magnitude in mass loss rate. Um, well, dust production rate may not be exactly the same thing. Um, and we have this group of sources here in black that we're trying to map in detail. Um, it's kind of difficult to, difficult to quantify how much time we have in total. Uh, the JCMT has given us about uh, 550 hours, um, and there's uh, some time on other telescopes, plus at least that much again in terms of archival data. Uh, I think I can skip that. Most of you so are probably... I'm curious, so the... the, the uh, <clears throat> what makes it wedding cake? I mean, are you using the, the field of view of Scuba 2 to get many sources at once? No. no. What I mean by wedding cake is we just sort of have this you know, <laughs> breaking things up into, it's kind of, I guess, an inverse wedding cake. So you know, you're still doing basically well. one star every pointing. Yes. Yeah, they're still too far apart to get uh, any overlap in that. Mm. 
I'm going to assume you're reasonably familiar with the EAO, even if not intimately so, so I can probably skip the previous slide. Um, so these are all the things that we're interested in. Some of them I've alluded to already. Um, for example, basically, we want to put that point on this plot. We want to say, this is the dust production rate for our own galaxy, and put that in, put that in the context of the local group galaxies. Um, the interesting or an interesting thing here is that we will have the hot dust and the cold dust, uh, which we can compare directly with the cold gas, which will then let us look at the uh, total gas return rate as well as dust, unlike Spitzer. Um, given that we have both gas and dust data, uh, we can actually go directly to figuring out what the dust to gas ratio is, just you know, divide one by the other. Um, this is critically important for constraining models of dust formation and therefore the wind driving um, because you know you're really tracing how much stuff are you condensing out um, and it will give people constraints for when they uh, just have dust observations and want to try and figure out what the, the you know, want to expect the uh, gas mass loss rates to be. Um, again I'll bring back these plots that I showed you earlier. Um, we'll have a huge sample of uh, mass loss rates and outflow velocities. And so we're hoping to you know, really put a lot more points, particularly in this region of the plots uh, at sort of the, in that transition region um, and figure out you know, exactly when are we switching into dust driven mass loss or pulsation driven mass loss. Uh, see if we can fine tune these, uh, these lines on here. Um, a byproduct of that uh, will be this sort of momentum, the, the outflow momentum and how efficiently are you transferring energy from the, the uh, star's photons into driving the outflow. Um, and that of course will be sort of a new constraint on these uh, plots, how we're driving the wind and uh, what is happening at each of those transition points rather than just where they are. Um, this one's a long shot because it relies on us having good quality data at uh, as many bands as possible. Um, but we uh, think we'll at least be able to get some preliminary constraints on what the sub-millimeter dust properties are like in evolved stars. And by that I mean you know, how much cold dust are they producing, but also what is actually the emissivity of these stars and how can that be useful to, uh, to interpreting other observations at, uh, with other facilities and so on. And what does that tell us about say the composition or size or shape of the grains. Um, so as I said, we're interested in mass loss history. We will not see anything this spectacular because we just don't have that sort of resolution. Um, but we can compare, compare these two methods of having you know, resolved observations and having multi-line observations and see if they actually meet up in the middle somewhere or see if there's something that we're missing. Uh, we'll get a good handle on what, you know, exactly how common is, uh, is variability uh, and what is its time scale. Like I said, at the moment, we basically see it everywhere we look but we haven't had that volume limited sample to really do the statistics and say, yes, 80 or whatever percent of AGB stars have variations on thousand year timescales. Um, we think we'll be able to see at least large scale deviations from circular symmetry and to constrain CO photo dissociation. Uh, and like I said, hopefully see variations in the gas to dust ratio uh, over time and as a function of mass loss rate. Now, if you're interested in galactic chemical enrichment, uh, so metallicity evolution, the thing to care about is, of course, the 13C ratio, because that's a very sensitive probe of AGB mass loss, or uh, sorry, AGB nuclear synthesis. Um, again, this is the state of the art in terms of understanding what the 12C to 13C ratio is in AGB outflows. Um, and it's a very sparse plot. We hope to have about 10 times more points, more sources to, uh, to look at than, uh, than Elvira was able to. Uh, so that should hopefully fill in this quite a lot. And we should start to see the sort of expected clustering of here, here, and who knows where in this one. Um, and this is really gonna feed into sort of people who are doing population <laughs> models, uh, evolutionary models on uh, understanding how nuclear synthesis takes place, when, when it matters, etc. What is the S, S star? 
Right. Um, yes. And um, S-star is an irritating contaminant if you want to try and figure out what's going on in uh, different chemistries. No. Uh, so what happens is that for certain initial mass ranges, uh, all your star, well, all of your stars start out oxygen rich, and for certain initial mass ranges, they uh, produce carbon and dredge it up to the surface. So you start off with an oxygen rich surface, and you gradually convert to a carbon rich surface. And the S stars, at least some of them, are basically that intermediate step where the carbon to oxygen ratio is approximately one. Uh, they're also typically the first ones where you see a lot of S process enrichment. So they end up with the S designation. And of course, if you have a big sample, in our case, 400-ish sources, you can throw everything at the wall, be hack the hell out of it, and see what sticks. Uh, so that's also maybe not quite worded like that, but also part of our science goals. Um, so this means you know, comparing whatever we can find out about the stars with whatever we have found out about their envelopes. Um, how do, say, the, uh, the expansion velocities or the dust to gas ratios depend on the stellar chemistry, on their abundances, on their pulsation period? Can we compare that with the dust mineralogy or with grain sizes? Um, and we hope that that will give some nice input to the modelers to try and improve their uh, population synthesis and so forth. Um, yeah, so I won't go into detail, but we have observations both in submillimeter continuum and in the, uh, the lines. Um, how are we going to analyze this? Well, resolved data is always a pain. Uh, so we're trying to figure out good ways of doing that. Easy ways are to you know, just measure an extension, uh, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, morphology is more complicated. Uh, and then compare things like extensions against other observed properties like line ratios, like the spectral index, of the submillimeter emission. Um, ultimately, we want to do radiative transfer model fitting. Um, doing that with resolved data is, of course, an extra complication. Uh, how do you weight, say, the SED versus the images? Uh, but uh, we think we have a good handle on how to do that. And again, throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Um, this plan is a bit out of date, uh, but uh, I don't think we're too far off target compared to this. Um, we have uh, one paper in review that we think should be published pretty soon. Uh, these other sort of papers telling you what we're doing, how we're taking data and what we're doing with it should be out, uh, well, at least submitted this year. And then there should be a whole load of other stuff that will come out over the next few years. Um, but yeah, hopefully soon. Uh, and there's a quick taster look at the data. Um, I'd like to mention something about our philosophy, how we're approaching this. The idea is that nests should be completely reproducible. Anybody else should be able, if they have enough computing power, to take all the scripts that we've written, uh, run them without any problems, re-reduce all the data, figure out what we did wrong, and publish their own papers about it. So all of our code should be on GitHub, no matter how insignificant. Um, we are writing new uh, reduction and analysis pipelines that build on uh, the software that the JCMT has released. And those will be uh, released. If people have similar observations, they can go and use them themselves. Um, we'll be, of course, releasing a whole load of catalogs with all of the results that we've got, and into those folding in data from all the existing catalogs. So if anyone is interested in one of our sources, they just go to our web page and look all this stuff up. OK, a little bit of very early science, because of course, when you've got a big sample of stuff, you often want to wait until you've got all of it in order to publish anything, but you can't really afford to do that. Um, so here's just a quick look at some of our heterodyne data. Um, this is showing you four sources with CO, 12 CO observations, um, which ranges of peak flux are uh, detected in 13 CO and which are not. That's pretty much what you expect, right? You have some sensitivity limit. And uh, you don't expect 13 CO to be brighter than 12 CO, so some, below some limit, you will not see any 13 CO. Nice and straightforward, fits with our expectations, all good. Um, now to put that in a different context, what is the, the ratio of the line fluxes versus the, CO, the 12 CO line flux? Uh, and again, it looks pretty much like you'd expect. You've got some sort of bottom of the envelope here where you're not sensitive enough to uh, detect 13CO, 
and then a sort of reasonable spread of points, but there's clearly something sort of here or, well, there's stuff in there that we haven't figured out quite yet, basically. Um, as I said, we also have resolved CO observations. Um, we still need a better understanding of the PSF of the JCMT to really uh, do this analysis properly. But again, like with the dust, uh, the continuum observations that middle are on the next slide, so that comment is maybe not so useful, um, we pretty much see at least a little bit of extended emission everywhere. Uh, and you can see this sort of here, that there's quite a lot of extra flux in this extended component. And we can go away and you know, do some very hacky comparisons between the, uh, the continuum and the line and try and trace the evolution of the dust to gas ratio as you go from the center of the envelope to the outer regions. And we do see some sort of trend um, that the gas to dust ratio is apparently lower in the outer envelope than it is in the middle. Uh, this is probably really tracing CO photo dissociation or excitation in that we're just not as sensitive to the CO emission where the gas is that cool uh, or the CO is being destroyed from, uh, from the outside. Um, so the, yeah, like I said, one of our objectives with this is to fill in these plots and uh, have some better statistics on what's going on. Uh, we have continuum data too. So this is just one example. This is uh, the paper that I hope will be accepted quite soon. And um, you can, in this case, we're doing a comparison between the Herschel data here and the SCUBA2 data here. And so the Herschel data, you can see there's sort of a, a feature here that's uh, uh, sort of a detached shell. Um, and it kind of lines up with what we see at 450 micron. But at 850 micron, there's some sort of extra stuff that we're not sensitive to with Herschel. Uh, we don't really understand that yet. Uh, but we think it's reflecting some sort of uh, change in dust properties because we don't expect there to be sort of an excess of four Kelvin dust in the inner envelope. Uh, so we're seeing something strange going on where the dust properties are changing in some parts of the envelope. Um, and this is maybe hopefully easier to see if you look at the radio profiles, but not so much. Um, yeah, not so much. Never mind. Uh, but so you can see how there's sort of this change in models which fit the Herschel data, don't really fit the 850 micron data, uh, and the models which actually fit the Herschel data the worst fit the 850 micron data the best. Uh, and we have a real problem produce, reproducing the total flux that we see at 850 micron. Did I include that? No, oh, okay. Um, where there's sort of this very persistent excess of flux at long wavelength of about a factor of two or three. So, okay, to come to my conclusions, hopefully I've convinced you that uh, evolved stars do matter, uh, even if maybe not absolutely directly to your science, um, and that Ness is gonna do some interesting things on uh, the total mass return to the solar neighborhood and statistical studies of uh, nearby evolved stars. Uh, we're about halfway through taking our data and we're sort of trying to process everything. Um, there's still lots to do. People are welcome to get involved. We have plans to follow up in uh, the, inter uh, the infrared and optical, um, but haven't sort of kicked those off yet. So if you're interested, uh, come and talk to me or take a look at our website, which admittedly is not fully populated yet, so may not have too much uh, useful in it. And thank you for listening. Uh, yeah, um, first of all, I'm somewhat surprised that you claim that, that the current samples are so so small. I mean, all, already uh, 15, 20 years ago, we must have had hun uh, several hun uh, hundreds of stars uh, detected in, in CO uh, in our galaxy. I detected there are, let's say, don't know the exact numbers, but yes, hundreds. Uh, the problem is getting that nice uniform coverage of the right lines of CO3 to 2 and 2 to 1 and their 13 CO counterparts. So there are lots of surveys of 12 CO, usually 1 to 0 or 2 to 1. Um, 
but having the sort of complete uniform sample, people haven't really uh, sort of developed enough uh, of that. And the other issue is that people have tended to either focus on the same stars again and again, the, you know, the interesting ones, um, or they've stuck to very nearby stars. And there are very, very few of those very, very high mass loss rate sources nearby. And you need to understand those ones if you want to understand the total mass uh, The next question is, uh, when, you, uh, when you observe uh, CO1 to zero, CO2 to one, or say, or say also dust at 850 micron, you, you essentially miss out on all the, all the uh, hot gas. So uh, uh, have you done direct comparison to, for example, uh, uh, Herschel uh, uh, Spire and uh, Pax photometry? I mean, there must be sources where you see up to, to J equals 30 or so. Um, we haven't yet but that is something we would like to do. And secondly, I mean, uh, uh, I'm more of a uh, 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 young stars, molecular cloud person, but, but I would say already when you go from, you jump from, say, above CO4, four to three, then, then you start seeing the, uh, hot gas come out, come out. And of course, JCMT doesn't have any, uh, any uh, uh, high frequency receivers any, anymore, but uh, uh, Apex, for example, uh, does routinely uh, CO six to six to five. And the station manager there uh, nowadays again is Lars Olke Newman, who used to uh, work on ATV stars. Uh, could uh, be a possible way to, to do a small test sample, if nothing more. Yeah, so we have been looking into using the archival data from the JCMT, because of course they did have uh, receivers that could cover 7 to 6 and 6 to 5 uh, in the past. Uh, um, well, uh, those were really crappy receivers. <laughs> so hardly anything. Four to three would, would uh, probably give you uh, a little bit better, but uh, that's kind of a trans uh, transition line, in my opinion, that you, you 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 can't really say. You need to go to six to five. Yeah, so we do want to see what happens if we do that. But of course, it's yeah. much easier to get. Yeah, to but the coach. first thing yeah. is, of course, just go to Herschel. Yeah. Herschel data. Uh, here you don't need uh, result, uh, 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 velocity results, spectra, but just uh, integrated intensity will be good enough. Yeah, and, and then just one yeah. extra comment. Since since I uh, normally work with proto, proto stars and uh, young stars, to me, AGB stars are so simple. They have lots of <laughs> spherical <laughs> symmetry, far more easier to model. <laughs> yeah, Um, I was wondering how, how, how the samples, you know, given this, this statistic, you're going for a statistical sample, uh, I, I don't have a good sense of how you select um, where, where these things come from. You select them from some sort of all sky colors or survey? Or yeah. yeah, so uh, IRS is still the go-to resource uh, for this sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> we are pretty much dependent on the 12 and 25 colors and then matching that against Ys and two mass and so on. Do Gaia parallaxes help? Or? Uh, the Gaia team keeps telling us they will, but so far, no. Um, AGB stars, they are convective and pulsating. So you're, you have like dark or hot spots, dark mm -hmm. or bright spots on the surface, which move on about the same time scale as the parallax motion, and it's pulsating on about the same time scale as the parallax motion. All of these things all sort of get together and conspire against us. 
Um, so for the more distant ones, of course, those motions are smaller, so you can get a more reliable What's the parallax. typical size of uh, angular size of your stars? Uh, the regions that you're looking at or whatever, <laughs> the shells, I don't know. Um, so the stars themselves, the closest AGV stars are about 50 milliarc seconds oh, in yeah. diameter. Oh, that's big. Uh, but of course, some of these things are a factor of 100 further away than those or I guess a factor of 50, so they'd be a lot smaller. But then, yeah, that's about similar size to the parallax. Yeah. With the, you know, killer person. One, one more, yes. So, so uh, uh, can you use uh, mid-infrared light? Vice, to me, had uh, uh, old sky. It wasn't as uh, sensitive to to saturation and their catalog actually uh, gives a good indication whether the stars are saturated or not. Uh, so uh, what would, uh, what uh, does kind of 20 micron give you compared to, to going to, to 70 micron? Right. Um, so if you can, well, in terms of the SED, that's a critical portion that you need to sample that sort of three to 25 micron region because there you're seeing the products of dust formation while it's still hot. Um, so you're actually, yeah, the, depending exactly on the wavelength, you're sensitive to either the, the dust that's forming right now or that's just a, you know, a few tens or hundreds of AU from the star. It's only been around for a hundred years or so. Um, but when you go to 70 micron, then you, you really shift outwards and sample a different part of the envelope. Uh, so you can kind of think of it as the instantaneous mass loss rate up to sort of 25 micron and more historical mass loss rate at 70 and longer. Uh, in resolved observations, if you can get high enough resolution, having those uh, shorter wavelengths is obviously great because then you're sensitive to structure and uh, variation in the inner envelope. Um, but that means you need a really big telescope. You need an eight meter uh, to see that region. Um, and the number of mid infrared instruments on eight meter telescopes is continually declining. I think we're now just down to Vizier now. Um, comics is gone as well. So yeah, we're running out of options for say N or Q band observing at that kind of resolution. Okay, anyone else? If not, let's uh, thank you again. Just as a side comment, uh, uh, there are options for far infrared even now, Sophia. You can get a sample with 400 objects, but you could likely get 10 or 15 maybe. And you can also get those which are saturated with with vice, for example, forecast goes to to 